Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh everyone Welcome to our new studio Inshallah we'll keep it consistent like this it Looks nice Especially with the switch Alhamdulillah Again we have with us Ustad Alamgir Ali Ustad Assalamu alaikum Assalamu alaikum As Ustad is here for six weeks obviously we had to decide whether we can get Ustad again Alhamdulillah he's been free and we've been able to have him So Ustad today the focus I wanted uh, or what I want to focus on were two things and shall I start with the first one? The first one was generally like the, the etiquette of seeking help. Now, uh, like obviously a lot of people abroad, especially let's say in London specifically because that's where we're from, mm. they've been brought up in a certain environment. However, whenever they want to go abroad, specifically like let's say something like Egypt or even Medina or anywhere else for that matter, they tend to bring their habits with them. And obviously we know that it's not easy to just change habits overnight, but mm. sometimes you just see, you know, stuff that's common sense, you know, relax yourself here, as in, don't be showing these kind of habits here. You know, keep yourself private with yourself. But they tend to bring it as if it's adi, as if it's normal. Mm. I mean, uh, what would you, how would you comment on that? Okay, uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Um, I mean, do you want to give specific sort of uh, examples maybe to start off with? Okay, I'll give you some examples that actually yeah. reflect, I mean, this has happened to me. Yeah. I've been in so many circumstances where, for example, I've met a brother and, you know, they, they're swearing left, right and centre. Mm. They're using the F word or the D word or the this word or the that word. Yeah. Or, or other examples where I'll see brothers where, let's say I'm living with them, at the same yeah. time I can hear them backbiting about me. Mm. And these examples that's, you know, that's happened to me. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. What would you say to that? Well, I think firstly, obviously, people that, that, that are coming here, mm. you know, they're obviously coming here to learn something. They're, they're coming here for self-development. And so naturally, uh, people have many things to work on in terms of their character. I, I think, uh, I mean, that, the, you know, what you've mentioned is, sounds... Uh, quite surprising, to be honest, because you know, for, from 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 the, when I first came, the the, the caliber of, of students was such that um, you know they were, you can say, practicing Muslims, people who were very concerned about their deen, and uh, uh, you know had the basic etiquettes of uh, of a, of a of a good Muslim, basically. Um, but I, I I can I can I can understand what you are saying. I have seen certain types of students come over the years and uh, certain things are questionable in terms of their commitment to the religion and what have you but I don't think that's necessarily you know it's not something we should shun in the sense we shouldn't shun such people because at the end of the day they've made that big decision to come here mm. which is a praiseworthy thing and people will be of different levels and some people I, mean, I remember there was a particular brother that came and uh, he was like a, a brother that was literally just off the streets. Um, so he spoke like a brother that was from the streets mm. and he behaved in that manner as well. But the, the fact of the matter is he came all the way from the UK to, to, to Egypt because he wanted to learn, he wanted to better himself. So I think that's a good thing. Now obviously people will have, will, will have shortcomings What's important is that people try to recognize those shortcomings and they try to rectify them, you know. So I think for, for, for the brothers who are maybe more senior here or who are more developed in their religion should give them a helping hand, you know, and support them, uh, try to assist them whichever way they can by giving advice, um, by making them help, helping them see their, you know, their errors. You know, as the Prophet ﷺ said, uh, uh, you know, al mu'minu mir'atu akhihi. The believer is a mirror to another brother. So, meaning that when do you look into a mirror? You look into a mirror when you try to spot if there are any blemishes on your face or on your appearance. And so, you know, we should be like that with one another. And um, so, I think that that should be our attitude to to such people. It should be that of of support. Uh, of assistance, of nasiha, of wishing good, genuine goodness for them. How would you, like, let's say for the people watching, how would you advise them? So let's say they want to make the move to just study, yeah. say, whether it's in the West or here, mm -hmm. in the East. What advice would you give them 
yeah. in terms of you know look you're going off to study uh how sh what mindset should would you yeah. provide them i think obviously the most important thing they that that a person needs to reflect over in such circumstances is what their intentions are uh, I mean, obviously, the, the topic of intentions is always discussed, and it seemed, you know, is is looked upon as a as a standard thing to think about. And but I think many people really un underestimate the the importance of it. And it's not just something that you tell yourself internally. You know, it's not just that. Okay, look, I'm going to Egypt. I need to focus on my intention. And so it's as if it's like an internal statement. I'm going to seek the, the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm. But really the niyyah is the, the actual driving force behind an action. It's the ba'ith. It's the, things that, it's, the, it's the thing that actually pushes you to do the action in the first place. And that's what we really need to look at ourselves and ask ourselves. What's actually pushing us to want to go and seek knowledge? I mean, it's easy to say I'm doing it for the sake of Allah. But is that what's really pushing a person? And you know there could be a variety of different intentions why a person, or well, a variety of different reasons why a person would want to go abroad to study. It could be because it's just you know intellectual satisfaction. It could be that a person likes to gain information. Okay, it could be that it's a it's like a fad. A lot of people are doing, their colleagues are doing, people of their age group are doing. Mm. Could be like peer pressure. People in their own sort of you know circles of of, of you know of friends. They they're doing. It so they want to follow suit. It could, there could be a number of different reasons. Um, for some people, it could be just to gain popularity and fame. It could be that, for example, they've recognized that they have a strength in, in, in learning a language or seeking knowledge, and so it's a way that they can gain some sort of fame and, and, and status. So that's the first thing they really need to ask themselves is what's actually pushing them? You know, what's the thing that's driving them? And, and they need to assess and see whether the thing that is pushing them is, is good um, and it's something that will bring about goodness in this life and the afterlife as well. But how does a person um, reflect over that? Number one, yeah. and number two, ideally, how should a person? I mean, what should a person be looking towards? As in, hmm. what kind of what kind of attitude, what kind of behavior should they work towards? Yeah. Obviously, whenever when going to yeah. seek, you know, uh, divine help. Well, the first question, I think it's it's a very difficult. Because at the end of the day, no one can really know what their true intentions are. You know, the scholars used to say things like, "Ma You know, I've never dealt with anything more difficult than my intentions, because it continuously, you know, changes. So we will never know whether we are truly sincere. As one scholar said, "Whoever claims he is uh, mukhlis, then his ikhlas requires ikhlas." Yeah. Meaning his, his claim of sincerity mm -hmm. requires like a purification. So we, we can never truly know. But the, 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 the most important thing is a person might say, well, then what's the point of me trying to determine what my niya is? Mm -hmm. you, the, the purpose is to try and purify as much as you can. Okay. And, but then, then the question is, what should my intention be? You know, what, you know, of course, we do it for the sake of Allah, but beyond that, I mean, there are many things we could do for the sake mm. of Allah. We can pray, mm. we can give charity, we can do other projects like that. But mm. what, why does seeking knowledge stand out from, from other actions that makes a person want to do it? So, you know, the scholars have mentioned, you know, over, over centuries, you know, sp specific intentions that a person can have when seeking knowledge, uh, other than the main reason being for the sake of Allah such as you know wanting to remove your own state of ignorance um, so that you're upon clarity so that you're upon certainty in terms of uh, how you're worshiping Allah subhanahu mm. wa ta'ala also you know wanting to remove ignorance from others okay wanting to preserve the deen uh, and preserve a sound understanding of the religion to help propagate the religion to help uphold the values of the religion. So these are maybe specific intentions um, that a person can have. But what about the driving force? How does one mm. get that driving force? Yeah, so that will, that will require, I think, um, a lot of thought and contemplation just for a person to see himself and see what he is capable of doing. So if he has that passion, so for example, if, at the end of the day, if he doesn't have that passion, for example, to remove ignorance from himself or to remove ignorance from others or wanting to benefit others or wanting to uphold the deen, then why is he seeking knowledge? Do you see? Mm. So 
you know, a person needs to ask himself those questions. Like if he doesn't have any of those sort of intentions, what's pushing him? Mm. So I think for many people, as I said, it could be just intellectual gratification. A person just wants to, they have that first for, for gaining knowledge. Um, it's something that they find that they're good at, for example. Mm. And so that's why they do it. Okay. And as I said, for other people, it could be that's best because what that's the, due to the pressure that's been placed upon them. That's why, they, why, why they're doing it. So, you know, and, and if, if, they, if a person realizes they're in that situation where they don't really know why they're doing it, then what I would suggest is that they look to those specific good intentions, such as wanting to remove ignorance from oneself, and um, you know, to uphold the religion, etc., to preserve the religion, to spread the religion, and to try and mould their intentions around, around mm. those particular points. You know, Sad, a lot of students, they come here, they come with an identity crisis. Mm. Like obviously, um, you know, they start practicing and like, you know, that's the, that's the first thing they come, that comes to their head. As in, I'm starting to practice, now I just need to gain knowledge. Now, mm. obviously they see the answer in Islam. Yeah. So what would your advice to them be, to mm. those group of people? I mean, I'm sure you must have seen a yeah, lot. Yeah, yeah. Well, firstly, you know, it's, it's a good thing that a person, once they start practicing, they want to start learning. Um, but, you know, as you know, in our, in our religion, we have different types of disciplines that a person can learn. You have those ulum sciences, which are considered tools, ulum al-ala, you know, tools by which you can access other types of information and knowledge. So, for example, Arabic language, grammar, you know, morphology, mantiq, logic, all of these sort of sciences which, are, which help a person to understand um, the, the ulum, the sciences which are goals in and of themselves, such as understanding the Qur'an and hadith, etc. So, these particular ulum, sciences, which are considered as tools, it's really important that students understand that these are tools. They are not objectives in and of themselves. Mm. Because, and it's, it, the reason why it's important to understand that is because, and I've seen over the years people complain that, you know, spending one whole year or two years just learning grammar and sarf and what have you can actually have an impact on your heart. Um, and uh, I've, I remember a number of times a lot of brothers actually said, not a lot, but a few brothers, they actually said that they felt that being in Egypt has actually, in, in, in a number of ways, made their hearts harder. Because, you know, they're not attending maybe, say, the weekly reminder that they used to attend. Uh, they're listening to khutbahs that they're not really understanding because maybe their level of Arabic is not that good. Whereas in the UK, at least the khutbahs are generally, well, depending on where you're yeah. praying, you know, if it's in English or, or in language that they understand. And so, you know, they're, they're learning a lot of, like, as I said, grammar, grammar and sarf is not going to soften your heart per se. I remember there was one brother who said, actually, Learning grammar was actually boosted his iman. Wow. So alhamdulillah, oh. you know, yeah. for some people it works, um, <laughs> you know. And yeah. but for others, you know, it can be a quite a, a dry experience. Um, I mean, personally, I, I love grammar. Mm. It's just something that I, I love studying. But you know, it wasn't. I wouldn't say it was learning grammar in and of itself was a spiritual boost. So, so it's really important that when students come, they realize that they need to prepare themselves for this long haul and that it's not going to be easy. That's why I'm in a way I am a bit concerned when newly practicing people come here. Mm. Okay, because of that because of that reason. And especially because there are no it's hard to find those sort of murabbi figures mm. that will give you that guiding hand and, and will take care of your iman whilst you're here. Mm. You know, your standard Arabic teacher might not be able to provide you that assistance and guidance. Okay, so that's why I advise that when students come here, they come ready and prepared to sort of take care of their own hearts whilst they are here. So whether it be, for example, you know, studying or reading books on the side in, in English, you know, whilst they're learning their Arabic to help develop their, you know, to keep them in tune with their sort of, you know, the inner, the inner, the inner aspects of the heart. Whether it's like reading Riyadh al-Salihin, having a daily... Uh, reading of Riyadh al-Salihin or daily reading of books pertaining to the Akhirah or reading Tafsir or reading the Quran in a language that they understand 
they should they should definitely have a portion of that on in, in their daily lives would you recommend them coming i mean making that jump you know newly practicing or yeah. they've been practicing for some time but obviously they don't understand that egypt is or even going abroad is a yeah. very very big step yeah would you recommend it? you see i think it all depends on the individual like for example if it's a, a person who just started to practice and he has a good group of friends around him that mm. can provide him that aid and that support and he's at a stage in his life where he has the time and the ability to go because one of the common questions many people have is you know is it the right time for me to go now or should i for example complete my degree or should i get married first mm. so it all depends on the individual in terms of whether he should be going now or later but there is a risk definitely of a newly practicing person coming here straight away mm. i would personally say if he has the ability to maybe to delay it until he has gained some sort of stability in his in, in his life uh, in terms of having a, 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 a being consistent in performing salah for example um, being consistent in um, in in practicing his religion mm. i think maybe establish that sort of basis whilst they're in the uk where they where they will have more support okay where mm. they will have more support they will have more uh, students of knowledge or sheikhs or imams that they can relate to okay because if you come here as an english speaker and you know you have a lot of personal problems as i said there's not really that much in terms of personal support you know um having said that though i don't want to i mean i, I think i'm sounding a bit negative mm. okay um, you know i don't want to say you know people to people don't come here no no without a shadow of a doubt coming here is, there's immense benefit okay but i think a person should um, come at a stage when they are ready and uh, you know where their where their deen is strong enough for them to be able to cope with you know spending hours a day learning you know memorizing words learning grammar principles and, mm. and what have you so so you know what about, you know, like i know a lot of people they um for example what they're truly looking for you can really see is that they're looking for a murabbi they're yeah. truly looking for her but they have the 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 preconception that you know if i come abroad everything's here the study is amazing so yeah. i just need to go abroad as in mm. uh, would you advise them to still come or you know well yeah I, i think you know they need to be realistic you know i think uh, uh people should be realistic and understand that you know it's not a magical place where you will find you know like a, a you know a master of the of the spiritual arts and you know and someone who can provide you that aid and support uh, when you come here and then you know by you know the, you know just in an instance you'll be able to change and transform and become this amazing student of knowledge or a sheikh or what have you it's a long and difficult process and people should have realistic aims so most people that come here their their goal is because most people won't have a long period of time they'll have a year or two mm. and you you in that period of time you know you can learn the basics of the arabic language you can you you'll, you'll be able to speak in arabic you'll be able to hopefully read um arabic books you'll be able to understand large portions of the you know a large amount of the quran you'll be able to understand that and hopefully by the, you know within a couple of years you could um, have memorized you know large chunks of the quran as well mm. so you know it should that should be clear in terms of what you'll be able to, to you know to learn and a, a person should also realize that um it's not impossible to learn your deen in england okay Yes it's difficult to to maybe learn the arabic language and learn a lot of quran in a short period of time in england because in england we'll be busy working or studying in our in you know other secular institutions mm. or what have you um so there's great benefit coming here for the, for a period of one or two years but when you go back that's where you can also learn as well mm. uh, even I, i i in the last podcast i i had with you i think i mentioned to you that um I felt as though my learning really flourished when I was actually in the UK not mm. here because here was just con- consolidating you know it was a rote method of 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 learning you're just sitting there memorizing memorizing repeating repeating and repeating it wasn't really the the sort of like a meaningful way of learning you know they have different methods of mm. you have the rote and meaningful methods of learning and so here a lot of it is just rote 
You know, you're, you are reading, memorizing, repeating, reading, memorizing, repeating. And so you're just doing that. Okay. So, but for me, as I said, when I went back to the UK, I was able to think a lot more about hadith, about the things that I, were read, I was reading. Um, but it was through that learning that I, uh, it's through what I learned in Egypt that helped me to uh, be able to engage in more meaningful learning. Mm. Yeah. Subhanallah. Like, yeah. I, I was just, I always think it's like coming to Egypt is more of getting a lot of information. Yeah. But the application is not exactly, it's not easy. Yeah. Say. Yeah. So it's not Knowledge is a, you know, it's a lifelong experience. Mm. You know, it's not just about memorizing information. And that's really important. I think people need to understand that because obviously in our Islamic tradition, a lot of our learning or the method of, of, of learning was through memorization. Okay, memorizing mutun, memorizing Quran, memorizing hadith and what have you. So naturally students, when they come here, they think, okay, this is what we need to be actually doing. But then what they might find is that, okay, they memorize a lot of Qur'an, they might, they might have memorized a lot of mutun, but they probably realize if they look back at themselves, they look at themselves, they haven't really developed maybe that much in terms of people as individuals, you know. And, um, and so I think what we need to do is reflect and ask ourselves a number of questions. Firstly, especially from people that come from the West, because students that come from the West, the rote method of, of learning and of, of, memorize, of memorizing texts, that's not our traditional way of learning. Mm. You know, in, in especially for example, in universities in the West, uh, we don't really memorize much. It's more, of, it's more critical thinking and understanding. That's the sort of method we are more used to. Okay, and that's why I think students struggle to memorize. Mm. Like when we see students here in Egypt and, and other parts of the Muslim world, you find that they can pick up things very, very quickly. They memorize things very, very quickly. One of the things students tend to complain about from the West is that they find it very difficult to memorize things. Mm. Um, now, I'm not saying that you know, we need to scrap that method of, of memorizing Mutun or what have you, but we need to realize that, um, number one, we don't really have that background in terms of that method of learning. Mm. And number two, uh, we need to understand that memorizing is there for a purpose. It's not just like, for example, you memorize hadith and that's it, you memorize it. What, what, what about understanding it? Mm -hmm. What about developing a meaningful relationship with what you've actually memorized? It's the same for like Hifz of Quran. Many people have memorized their Hufaz. Mm -hmm. But sadly, how much has that Hifz actually impacted their character? Very little. Yeah, yeah you can argue that, I think, for, for many people. And that's because they haven't really engaged with the Quran in a meaningful mm -hmm. way. And, and I think that's really important for students to understand that in a hifz of mutun in particular it's not the be all and end all of seeking knowledge you know you will hear about people i mean for to me when, when i hear like a person has memorized al fiya of ibn malik al fiya of al hafiz al iraqi and to me it doesn't really mean much mm. and a lot of people say wow he's memorized all of that you know okay what has he done with that mm -mm. you know what has he done with that you know um and Thing, and that's why I don't, I don't actively encourage people to memorize Mutun, to be honest. For Western students, I don't actively encourage them to memorize Mutun uh, other than Quran and Hadith. Quran and Hadith, I think it's important to memorize. But Mutun, I think um, that you can go around that, especially with, uh, uh, with our method of learning in the West. You know, students in the West tend to be more critical thinkers. And uh, so they engage with the text more. They have, a, uh, they have the ability to think, I, believe, I personally think that they have, the, they have a better ability to understand the, um, the, the text that they're studying compared to people who have grown up just to memorize. Memorize. You know, memorize and memorize. But you know, like, okay, fine. So let's say specifically Western students. Now, I know many of our ulama, they say they put a very big emphasis on memorization. Yeah, but yeah. obviously, specifically for Western students, would you, would you advise that they uh, focus more on the understanding yeah. Let's just say they don't have, obviously, they, don't, they can't commit 20, 30 years of their life, obviously, yeah. given our circumstances. So, yeah. but would you say focus, pri uh, prioritize the understanding whilst also doing hift at the same time, but very slowly or at least a slower pace than. Yeah. I think there's no harm in, in trying, especially memorizing like basic mutun on, mm. on every, in every field. 
you know, so, you know, if a person feels like memorizing uh, a text like Ajurumiya, Ajurumiya will, will help them in, uh, in their grammar, then Alhamdulillah, you know, that's, they, they can attempt that. Mm. Okay, but as I said, I've met people that have memorized Mutun, but, you know, they end up forgetting it. That's another issue. Okay, it's the same for Quran. You know, we always say with Quran, even the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, you know, that the, 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 the Quran, Ashaddu Tafallutan, yeah, it, it, it escapes you, you know, quicker than a horse, a camel, if, if you untie, an, an un, untied camel, mm. it'll just, you know, bolt off. So, uh, and that's why you always have to keep revising Quran. But when it comes to Mutun, and I'll be honest, I memorize a number of Mutun, mm. and, uh, in, and I've, I've forgotten quite a lot. Um, because I don't refer back to it directly unless I'm teaching it. Mm. Like certain things I've taught numerous times, like al Rumiya, and I've taught that numerous times. So, and I, I didn't actually sit down and memorize it, but I've actually ended up memorizing it because the amount of times I've taught it. Mm. Um, but again, if you're not engaged in repeating the the, uh, the the books and going over them again and again, you'll end up forgetting it anyway. Okay, that's why I think the only thing that really um, I mean, this is my personal way that I would teach uh, students. And I know many mashayikh and scholars would advise students to, to memorize. But you, ought to have, you also have to understand they're coming from a particular background. Okay, so they've gone through that sort of traditional school of, of memorizing mutun and what have you. Mm. And, um, and, uh, and so naturally, that's what they would encourage others to do. But... Um, you know, we're, we're people from different parts of the world. And so I think that really has to be taken into consideration. I don't think that there's a standard method of learning that, can, that is universal and that can apply in absolutely every way. And, and it could be in superimposed upon any mm. sort of learning environment. You know, okay, I'll come back to the point of um, just adab in general. Yeah. You know, so that you, I've, I've fallen into this trap a lot. Uh, and I've seen a lot of people fall into this trap in, in the sense that, you know, uh, I remember actually I read it on one of your Facebook posts as well. You know, you when you first when you first learn something, you feel like you know the whole, you know, you know everything. Yeah. And after a while, you realize you know nothing. Yeah, yeah. But you know, even like I said, I fall into this trap in the sense that you know you learn a little bit, mm. and you see a thing where brothers feel like you know I have to tell the whole world and I have to impose it on others as well. Yeah, yeah. That's definitely a uh, it's a common thing. You know, I think we. have I think all students of knowledge at one stage in their life, they experience that. Um, it's a good thing, in a way, you know, that you want to share the khayr, okay? You want to share the goodness. But at the same time, the, 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 it is susceptible to a lack of ikhlas as well. Because, you know, the Prophet Sallam, you know, warned people um, about seeking knowledge in order to impress other people and in order to challenge other people. You know, the mubaha of ulama to challenge them and to what have so you know that's definitely a, it, it's dangerous ground you know so, talib al-ilm generally although there's there's great scope of um of of reward but there's also grave danger as well you know in the sense that if you do it for the wrong reason okay you could potentially incur a lot of sin mm. you know and there are many great actions in our religion that you would think a person would only do if they were truly sincere you know, such as memorizing the Quran, being a shaheed, you know, uh, giving charity. These are actions, and that, this is obviously the famous hadith I'm referring to, the hadith Abu Hari radiallahu anhu. The first group of people that will, be, that will enter into the fire will be these three people. The half of the Quran, um, a shaheed, and a, a person who engages in charity. And these will be the first three. And subhanAllah, what's amazing about these three people is that they've sacrificed so much and a person who sacrifices so much you would think therefore that they are doing it sincerely you know mm. because if you're insincere then your intentions are you know they're going to waver they're not going to be very strong and what have you so that's a very frightening hadith <coughs> and that's why actually abu huraira radiallahu an he used to his knees used to shake Subhanallah, when he used to narrate this hadith, some narrations mention he would f faint. He would mm. faint, and when he every time he would try to narrate hadith, the hadith because it's so serious. Because you know, how many of us can 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 claim? I mean, we haven't. Many of us haven't memorized the Quran or 
have reached the, the level of shahada of martyrdom and you know and, and we're, we're given so much in charity you know and uh so how can we claim that we're really doing it for the right reason? But anyway, going back to the the point you mentioned about um, yeah, uh, doing a little bit of ailment, imposing it. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's a dangerous thing. You know, it's very positive in one way that you want to share goodness, but at the same time, you have to question yourself why you why you, why are you doing it? And that's why, uh, even like with social media as well, when a lot, a lot of times people they say things. And they, they're, they're sort of impressed about it themselves, and that's why they share, they share it with others. And that's dangerous as well. Mm. That's dangerous. Um, you know, uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, Thalatha muhlikat, there are three things that destroy a person. Okay? Shuhun um, muta'ah, when a person just follows his greed. Wahawan uh, muttaba, when a person follows his desires. Wa'ijab al mar'i bi ra'i nafsihi, and when a person is amazed with his own opinion or his own sort of you know, view on things. And so a lot of the times people end up sharing bits of information and that they feel, you know, that, that they are impressed by, you know. And, um, and that can make t the heads turn, mm. okay? It can get the likes and the shares. <laughs> and that's, that's very, you know, dangerous. And that's why the, the scholars used to say that, you know, th there were people that we met you know, they're like they were talking about the generation of the Tabi'een, maybe the Sahaba, that um, you know, if they they had knowledge, but if they had you know spoken that knowledge, if they had mentioned that knowledge, they would have sh spread so much khayr, but they chose not to, out of fear that they would be insincere. You know, and so and that's why they used to say that if you find yourself that al kalam yu'jibuka that. You're sort of impressed with your own speech. Mm. Be quiet, and then if you find that your sukut, your silence, impresses you, then speak. Mm. Okay, and that's very profound, you know, because there's, you know, there's even that fake humility that people might have, mm -hmm. where they think, no, I'm not going to spread any khayr and you know, and um, because out of fear of riya and showing off and what have you, but it could be because. Uh, you know, lack of sincerity. It, it could be because, again, you're trying to impress people, but with your sort of fake humility, you know, and um, and there could be other reasons for that as well, even. So, have you, know? you not seen the like? Uh, well, I, I'm sure you have. But you know, a lot of people they come practicing, but you do see a very, I don't want to say fake, because obviously, Allah alam with the intention, but mm. they come across as a very different person, as in, as in their how they're not being, as you can tell, they're not being genuine. They're mm. trying, to, you know, they're trying to be nice. They're, they're trying so best, and, and like you know, you know, uh, for example, you meet a person, and suddenly they're praising you, they're mm. doing this to show that you know I'm humble, I'm this and that. Yeah. I mean, what would you say to that? <coughs> I think it's difficult to to know what's in a, I suppose what's in a person's heart. Mm. Um, and as I s said at the beginning, I think when people want to start practicing, they will naturally. They will have many shortcomings. I mean, we all have shortcomings, whether you've been practicing Islam for years or whether you're at the beginning stage. Um, you know, perhaps they just need more time to, to, to develop themselves. How would you advise them, then? in the sense that what would you tell them to do initially, or even yeah. you know, as a person throughout your life, what would you advise them? With? Well, I think uh, you know, when engaging with other people, advice doesn't just always come about through. Um, you know, uh, with words. And sometimes it's just your mu'amala, your dealings with them. Mm. You know, and uh, and I think that's really important that nasiha, giving advice and directing people, is not just through words; it's through actions as well. Mm. So when people see you engage with others in a particular way, um, then you know th 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 that can leave an impact on, on them. You know, it can leave an impact on them. And um, and uh, and I think that's uh, a way of a positive way of influencing other people, mm. you know. And we also have to be careful as well because you know, in the in the field of seeking knowledge, one of the things that uh, and this was I, I was told this from from an early stage, and uh, I didn't come to realize it until some experiences that I had, but. Uh, there are certain things that, c that, that, that are ripe within the Talab al-Ilm circle. Things such as hasad, 
and sort of van, envy and, and suspicious thoughts. So, for example, envy is quite common because you want to gain a lot of knowledge. You don't want anyone to really surpass you in that. Mm. Okay, so you'll be learning a lot of things. You'll maybe be having secret classes and what other people are unaware of. Um, and, and, you, and you're keen to, to maximize the benefit and not, re, not to really share that benefit with other people. And, but then, uh, then you see other people also doing a similar thing and then this, the envy sort of creeps in. Sort of van as well. Um, and so ego, ego issues as well. So these are things which are quite, sadly, can be common you know, when, when, when seeking knowledge. And I think it's very important that a person strives to protect himself from from those from those qualities yeah what about the um, like obviously we, we see from the the stories of the uh, the salaf that obviously when they were young they used to spend a good 20 years with the teacher just learning at the yeah. manners from them yeah, yeah. would you advise or not, okay obviously i don't want to use advice but obviously because advice not always as well as you said mm. but as in you know for people who are watching would you say it's better that they do that say they at least try to implement that to some extent or how should they go about it? Yeah. Rather than going through the, just going for pure ulum, mm. pure sciences, how, yeah. what should they do? Well, I is, uh, I mean, that generation, I think, um, those generations where, where, where people would learn adab from their teachers, I'm not saying it's disappeared, you know, it's still there. It's definitely very hard to find teachers that you could just sit and learn adab from. Okay, it's hard. It is hard, um, and uh, you know. But to to reach that level of where you're sitting with scholars like that, it'll be very hard for people that are coming from the West to to ex to experience that. Because at the end of the day, you know, those sort of scholars that uh, that that have such qualities of like impeccable character, understanding of the religion. At the end of the day, they're not going to be teaching al arabiya bain mm. you know, or al ajrumi You know, they're not going to be teaching basic things. You know, these are things they'll be teaching. You know, ulum in in, uh, in Arabic, and maybe teaching teaching advanced texts and what have you. And then for you to even get that personal relationship with them uh, will take some time to to forge. So it's not really, I think, a maybe a, a practical. Uh, so for people that are coming here for a period of one or two years, it's going to be hard to reach to that level where they'll be able to sit in such gatherings. Mm. Okay, uh, but there there is an alternative to that, which is reading the biographies of of those scholars, reading how they were. And that's why the scholars always advise to to read the biographies of of scholars, uh, read about their akhlaq, so that you can try and emulate them. You know, so obviously in the past. Books weren't as widespread as they are today. Mm. So the way people would learn akhlaq is would be through people, which is always the best way, I think. But now we have a wealth of resources. You know, we have biographies of great scholars. We have Imam al Dhahabi Sir Alam al which is uh, one of the greatest encyclopedias or you know um, accounts of, of of scholars and, and pious worshippers. So you know, it's good to maybe have a, a daily sort of portion and maybe reading biographies of, of these great scholars to to really um, uh, so you can try and emulate them mm. in, in their positive and their, in their good qualities would you know uh, would you would there be no other alternative in terms of like rather put, putting the books to the side as in yeah dealing with someone yeah I mean if you can find a teacher if you can find a teacher whilst you're here um, or even in the West or even in the West exactly yeah. Yeah, exactly so as I said learning is not just limited to um, uh, to, to, to Egypt or a Muslim country. You could learn a lot in, 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 in your own country. It's a, it's a matter of finding people. The, the, the question here though is that in this day and age, everything has sort of shifted from the sort of traditional environment of learning from you know, masajid and places of learning to the sort of virtual realm. Uh, so now a lot of people learn through videos, um, through recordings and what have you, which is not bad, it has its benefits, but there's, there's one thing that is lacking is, is that direct human interaction. And I think that's something that needs to be looked into more uh, in the West. 
I think people need to try to um, you know, try to set up uh, initiatives that allow that allows that that human one-to-one interaction. Mm. Okay, and that's really important. I think to have that. But as I said, you know, people are becoming more dependent on on uh, on like social media and the and, and the internet uh, to learn. And so as a result, you know, they don't have find that sort of eagerness and that desire to want to go to a, p- a place physically. And I've seen that, you know, over the years, you know, comparing what I was doing as an imam to what I'm doing now, there's a massive difference. You know, people, for example, don't really find and have the ability to to attend a masjid on a weekly basis other than a khutbah. Mm. You know, it's rare to find people attending a masjid for a dars on a weekly basis. You know, if you ask a lot of practicing people in the UK, where do you go on a weekly basis other than a khutbah? Do you go to a masjid on a weekly basis? just to attend a lesson or to attend a gathering, you know, a lot of people surprisingly I think would say that they don't, mm. you know, that they don't. I mean, they might watch things, which is good, alhamdulillah, as I said, but as for that personal one-to-one interaction, it's, it's, it's lacking. How important would you say though, is in regards to a person's, a person's uh, personal development, Yeah. how important is that? I think it's so important, it's yeah. immense, you know, it's because <clears throat> Knowledge itself, you know, it's not just, ilm is not just information. Mm. You know, Imam Malik, he would say, an nur ilmun. You know, knowledge is, is light that, um, that, he throws in, uh, that Allah throws into the heart of, his, of, a, of, of a believer. And that light really needs to be, uh, that light of knowledge, yeah, you know, it's... Our tradition is that it was it was passed on from from person to person, you know. Uh, and the scholars have you know like Imam Shafi'i used to say that um, whoever takes his book as his sheikh, he will end up having many mistakes. Mm. And uh, Sufyan Thawri would say things like, um, you know, knowledge was passed on down from from person to person. Once it entered into the books, that's when it, <laughs> problems arise. Do you mm. see? Mm. And so, uh, knowledge needs tarbiyah. How to understand ulum, how to understand disciplines, how to understand masail, um, you know, you need to be trained in, 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 in the right way. Okay, you need to be trained in the right way. And that can only happen, I think, through personal experience. Sitting down, with, because there's a lot you can learn just by the way a scholar, for example, receives a question. Forget about how he answers it, but just the way he receives the question. What do I mean by that? So a person could just throw a question at you and you just say, okay, the answer is this. You look for the answer in a book. But you see a scholar, for example, the way the, the, uh, the scholar answers a question, you'll see that the method that he tries to attain the tasawwur of the mas'ala, just to understand what's actually happening, uh, it's quite profound. Mm. You know, they will leave no stones, stones unturned. They will try to really develop a good understanding of the actual mas'ala before they even try to answer it. Okay, and uh, you know, as one scholar said, Al-Aqilu, you know, the intelligent one, he asks, you know, Limadha qala ma qal. You know, why does a person say what he says? As for the person who is, who is Sathi, who is very, like a, a literalist, or very super, no, not literal, but superficial in the understanding, he'll just say, Madha qal, you know, what did he say? That's all he wants to understand. But the, the Aqil, the intelligent one, he will ask, why does he say what he says? You know, there could be a particular uh, background or particular circumstances behind why he's asking that particular question. And, and, and things like this you can only gain through few human interaction by seeing how, uh, how other people, uh, how people of knowledge engage with ilm. Mm. You know, again, with, with ilm, just to s- uh, sitting down with a scholar and seeing how um, how he, he might understand a particular hadith and what the different ihtimalat, different possibilities on the way you can understand a particular masala. You know, these sort of discussions and interactions you can only really gain when engaging with someone personally. So I think it's profound. And, and without that human interaction, without, without that sort of guide, I think it's, um, you know, knowledge can be dangerous. Mm. Knowledge can be very, very dangerous. And also, I've seen, this is one uh, observation I've seen, tell me if you agree with it, 
this, uh, that a lot of people who who do have a lot of focus on their akhlaq, who do really mm. care about their akhlaq, they tend to do a lot better than, let's just say, other people who just come in guns blazing as in, in terms of wanting to learn, wanting to learn. Yeah. yeah. But they obviously, because, yeah, just that. No, I think it's, it, it's true. People who, uh, as I said, the path of seeking knowledge, it's a difficult path. And there are many obstacles um, in your that, that that can prevent a person from truly benefiting from from the knowledge that they've gained, and there are a lot of those obstacles are internal affairs. Okay, mm-hmm. as I mentioned, things like the ego, uh, envy, uh, you know, even spite and malice and, and what have you. So these things can are very detrimental to a person's learning, and uh, often. A person might end up really amassing a lot of information, but whether it truly benefits them or not, I think it can only really benefit someone who has, you know, focused on their internal state and their akhlaq. Subhanallah. Yeah. Subhanallah. Jazakallah khairan, for that. That's very insightful. I'm going to go to the next topic, which is 